Now joining me from the London Podcast Studios are two mail order models, starting with one making his media podcast debut. It's Private Eyes, Adam McQueen. Hi, Adam. Hello. It's nice to be here. Uh, it's lovely to have you here. Um, you write The Street of Shame. The large l- chunks of it, yes. Yes, yeah. there's kind of a long-running section about the press in, in Private Eye. Um, have you been tracking the runners and riders of The Telegraph and whether it's, who's going to require it? Very much so indeed, yes. Yeah, no, our lead story last week was when the news had just come out about Nadim Zahawi being pulled in, of all people, to front a bit by the Barclays to try and take back control of the Telegraph, mm-hmm. uh, apparently with money from the United Arab Emirates, which just seems like the. I mean, it, it's an ambitious bit, isn't it? Yes. They're basically going to go to a, a load of investors in the UAE and say, so these are the guys who screwed up the business, their businesses so badly that the bank actually took this off their hands. Get them back in. And, Who better to run the place? And they're going to try and get it, get that bought from the bank that already knows them for for less money than they actually owe that bank. <laughs> oh no, it, it is extraordinary. No, no, it's fascinating. It's, it's a fantastic story. It's kept us going all summer, and, and, and the, the official auction hasn't even started yet. That doesn't kick off till next month, so it's uh, just going to run and run. And there's still a lot of discussion that it might not all go in one group. So something like the Spectator, uh, Murdoch's potentially always Rupert's been very keen to to get that one into his fold. Yeah, Murdoch's, that might Murdoch's keen on that one. Yeah. Um, uh, DMGT, the Daily Mail publishers, are uh, very keen to uh, get both Telegraph titles, but that could potentially get them into trouble with uh, media plurality because, of course, they've got not only both mail titles, which are amongst the only papers in the country which still sell an awful lot of mm. copies every day, but they've got the Metro as well, which mm. obviously adds on an enormous circulation, so it would give them uh, an enormous share of the market, which is the sort of thing that, uh, you know, the old Monopolies and Mergers Commission, as they were, used to used to get quite concerned yeah. about in the and, days of old newspaper takeovers. And also may be funded by the Middle East as well. Yes, which also potentially could run them into trouble, because of course it was only a few years since the government ordered uh, an inquiry into not the Lebedevs themselves taking mm. over the Standard and the Independent, but when they pulled in extra, um, extra shareholders from... Saudi Arabia. So, you know, that whole question of, of, of money coming in from overseas and control of, 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 of British press assets could um, could get them into a world of trouble yeah, and, and, if, and if, regulatory stuff there. If you are a boring bank and you just see all of that on the horizon, maybe going for a safer offer, if there is one, uh, is probably the better decision, isn't it? That, well, yeah, well, it, it probably would be. And also, I mean, you've got to ask in this day and age, aren't, aren't newspapers, uh, even in their digital form, mm-hmm. necessarily the sort of thing you'd want to be throwing a lot of money into? Uh, and next to us uh, is the journalist and critic Scott Bryan. Hello, Scott. Hi, you right? Uh, I'm good. I noticed you've become a member of BAFTA. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I have. Um, I think, like, the 13-year-old TV <laughs> geek me losing his mind that, like, one day I could... Watch so much TV that I would be allowed in. But uh, what a treat! Well, I, I'm I'm not trying to do you down at all. But okay. When, when, when I when I was looking at it, there is obviously people have to apply to become yes. a member, and I'm not saying it's a lottery because obviously they're picking the people, but it's not easy to just get a membership. It's not like just doing a direct debit and just getting your card in the post. I mean, in the end, they do ask for money. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's great. Welcome in. Please give us some money. So um yeah no I mean I think it's uh it's certainly interesting because I think BAFTA is also trying to widen their membership. They're trying to make sure it's much more reflective because of course the awards have been in for for headlines probably not in the way that BAFTA would be potentially liking over the course of the last few years so I think it's trying to make sure that the industry that is the kind of the flagship is absolutely representing the industry that it actually is uh is running uh, and also handy if you need a wee in central London <laughs> yes that's the yeah, other that's thing good. I was realising <laughs> so there's nothing really around Piccadilly <laughs> so it just kind of works really handy, handy. yeah handy uh, we'll go on to our first story uh, about Clarkson's farm and Scott um uh, you spoke to some of the Amazon bosses, I think, at the TV festival, because it looks like after months of speculation, uh, Jeremy Clarkson shows uh, Clarkson's farm uh, is going to be renewed by Amazon Prime. Um, and maybe before we find out from you, Scott, what happened, um, Adam, can can we remember what the controversy was about Clarkson's farm, about so whether it was going to get renewed? The controversy was nothing about the programme, was it? It was nothing about his television work at all, in fact. It was, mm. the, it was the column in The uh, Sun, which he wrote just before Christmas last year, in which he said he wanted to see hated Meghan Markle on a cellular level. He hated her in the same way that he hated uh, Nicola Sturgeon, which would be one thing, but also Rose West, the mass mm. murderer, mm. Uh, and that he specifically wanted to see her um, uh, paraded through the streets naked and pelted with excrement. Um, and there was a few other things in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was his Christmas present. But it was, it was obviously. I mean, it was, it was concluded eventually by the press watchdog Ipso that there was a sexual element to the uh, oh, to, to to the taunting of her. Mm. Uh, they 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 put aside um, accusations that, 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 that they, they they didn't find there was a racial element to it, but there was a sexual one in there because he talked about her using her bedroom wiles to <sighs> draw in um, uh, 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 Prince Harry. It really was. It was like he was trying to kind of tick off every kind of offensive thing on the world. And it was the most extraordinary thing because he, he almost immediately backed down, mm. as did the Sun. Mm. Um, 
um, and said this is this is this is completely unacceptable. But he he remains in the sun. He remains in the Sunday Times. He's kind of, kind of contrite there. He's kind of got turned into woke Jeremy, which was not something you ever expected to happen. And he's writing very sympathetic pieces about trans rights and all sorts of things for the Murdoch Press now, which is is, is, is a strange transformation. And he was talking about being a podcast convert this week uh, as well, because uh, indeed he had listened to a podcast that I appear on, page ninety four, <laughs> the Private Eye podcast. I, I noticed he only mentioned the mess- he, he he talked about the episode that we talked about him in it. So whether he's actually uh, listened to any of the others yet, we don't know. Uh, so Scott, you were trying to push the Amazon bosses, weren't you, on this one? Yeah, because earlier in the year, Variety had reported that Amazon was going to cut the long-standing ties that they've had with Jeremy Clarkson, mm. not just with Clarkson's farm, but also with the Grand Tour, which of course has now been kind of changed into just irregular specials. Mm. So they hadn't really had an update about what they were going to do. Of course, season three had already gone into production, had been filmed and seemed to have run its course. So when I kind of pressed them on stage at the end of a TV festival, um, I got back that they were kind of shocked and dis- disappointed about his actions and there was kind of a real sort of mea culpa about that. But then they were bizarrely kind of at the, at the same time quite defensive over the actual programme itself. And they t- created this sort of situation where they were trying to distance Clarkson's farm from Clarkson, <laughs> like highlighting that it's a bigger show than just Jeremy mm. Clarkson. It highlights the agricultural issues facing the country. There's all of these other characters within it that are a delight to viewers. And I had to sort of say to them, look, it's called Clarkson's Farm. <laughs> like you, can't, you can't separate for two. So they didn't really give an indication about its future there. They were kind of vague. So this news from Deadline Today by Jake Cantor to say that actually it looks as if they might be having a mm. renewal um, after all, doesn't really come as much of a surprise. Mm. I think it's also the fact that you know Amazon can be very cryptic about how successful a lot of their shows are, considering that they spend an awful lot of money on them. Mm. Um, but it's clear to see that when it comes to their UK slate, uh, Clarkson's Farm is, is right up at the, at the, the top. So they're probably thinking, oh, OK, he is a big liability and he said some downright awful things, but maybe we can't really lose him because we haven't really got as many hits to replace him. But is this also that it's way cheaper than the Grand Tour, which they probably signed at a kajillion dollars? Oh, I mean, uh, the, and, and yeah. this is like a nice, this was probably the, the extra thing he had to do as part of the deal and suddenly it's turned into a mega hit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look across their slate, really, I mean, sort of James May has kind of done his own kind of cooking sort of variation. Um, that feels like a very BBC Two show. There's also been a travel program mm. that they've also done that has nothing to do with cars with James May attached. So I think a lot of it is is very much their style of try a spin off, see whether it works. If it hits a certain metric that is not really public, then they will commission some more. I think they're now also with, with Amazon branching, I think a bit further, a bit more competitively into making big franchises of things. Mm-hmm. Because if you have a big franchise, you can sell products related to it. It ties up very well within the, um, the Amazon ecosystem. Mm. So I think these days, like that was the main thing I got throughout the entire of the Edinburgh TV Festival. It's focusing much more on about creating a brand yes. than just creating a TV show. It does seem a bit rich for Amazon to be sort of saying in 2023 that they've only just realised that Clarkson might be a bit of a liability and a loose <laughs> I mean, you've only got him because he was sat from the BBC for punching a producer. I mean, this is yeah. this is what you get with it. And you were very keen to throw a lot of money at him in the, uh, back, back then. Well, Jeremy Clarkson likes podcasts. So there's another one that's been added uh, to the uh, podcast list. Um, and this is Political Currency, the new show featuring George Osborne and Ed Balls. Uh, it landed on podcast apps yesterday. That's Thursday. Uh, this is from the makers of the news agents, Persephonica, led by the former BBC news producer, Dino Sophos. Um, Scott, it's an indie production, but it's not tied to global it's kind of a persephonic thing yeah um a lot of coverage for it a lot of coverage of it i think just because of the fact that it comes from the same people who made for news agents mm. which of course has been a real big hit um for global i think also dino sophos being behind it he was a creator of newscast which is still kind of one of the biggest podcast names the bbc has uh, there's that dua lipa podcast too yes. that managed to have i think really intelligent discussions about pop culture that mm. i think people did not really expect so I think just the names behind it to, I mean, the fact that you've got a chancellor and a former um, a shadow chancellor, um, George Osborne and Ed Balls tied to it too, um, I think gives the reason to believe within the media circles that this would be a big hit. I guess the challenges I think at the moment is not really anything to do with Percy Veronica. It's just whether there is a saturation mm. of the style of podcast because there's been now, the rest is politics with Roy Stewart and Alistair Campbell. Um, there's, of course, the rest is history, which is, of course, not really mm. political, but similar. Um, there's the one with Steph McGovern and Robert Peston yep, that just launched money. in the mm. last week. So it's becoming quite a crowded market mm. very quickly. I think there is an appeal to these style of podcasts, having two people with an, maybe an opposing view 
talking about something that uh, it, you know a big topic in different ways. And I think also quite nice that at a time when a lot of social media can just have people who agree with you on there, mm -hmm. that you're able to have polite intellectual di discussion from opposing views to show that actually there might be more similarities than differences between us. But it's just down to the fact about whether anyone's really got enough time to listen to all of these podcasts. Uh, I mean, Adam, uh, George Osborne and Ed Balls actually are quite funny. Are they? I think so. I think George Osborne is... Those hilarious austerity policies yeah, well, brought fun to millions. I don't know. I think that there is... I, mean, it has, I think that he has something. There is something interesting about the two of them. There is evidently a chemistry between the two of them, which has got them onto an awful lot of TV programmes. I don't know. The extraordinary thing was the trailer that they videoed for it. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Where they were, they were carrying um, boxes uh, along the street. The, the, the implication being that they'd just been sacked <laughs> from their jobs. It was actually quite a while ago. They seem to have picked up every job going <laughs> since. I mean, George Osborne has done so many jobs that he's so utterly unqualified for ever since, including being editor of the Evening Standard very, very badly. And for goodness sake, he's now chairman of the British Museum. Should he not be concentrating on getting back some of that stuff that's been looted from the stock rooms? Maybe that was in the box. I well, don't know. Well, George Osborne said on uh, another media programme that uh, all of these jobs uh, bring input that he can bring to his other jobs. So it's really, it's good that he's doing lots of things. Yeah, that's, it's always handy for your says. bank balance as well. Um, why really, do, why yeah. do you think the two of them are, are doing it? Is it just ego? The, this or one, is it, this one looks like, cash? I've got to say, this one looks like an absolutely cynical rip-off. It looks like some people have looked at... Um, Rory Stewart and Alistair Campbell and say, hey, that works really well. Who else have we got who could do that mm. one? And you just get this slight feeling that, you know, this is the beginning of a, of, a, of, a, of a long slow. If they were still around, I'm sure we'd end up with Mrs. Thatcher and General Gaultieri <laughs> co-presenting something called Agree to Differ. But I, it just, I don't know, it doesn't work for me as a former. I, I never wanted to listen to Alistair Campbell when he was haranguing journalists down the phone about what they should and shouldn't write mm. at, at number 10 and threatening people. But I don't, I don't want to listen to him on a podcast. But either, that has personally. been a massive hit, hasn't it? It's, it has been huge. And it's it making huge. them yeah, yeah. huge there is amounts of cash out there for it. Yes, yeah. But the, I mean, the thing is, it, podcasting, I guess, is a bit like publishing, isn't it? Is no one ever knows what the next big thing is going to be. No mm. one would have predicted that the the Campbell and Stewart podcast was going to be the huge thing, just as no one would have predicted that the girl on the train was going to be the huge mm. thing. And then, you know, for two years after that, every book that came out had this a very similar cover, and if they could possibly get it in there, <laughs> the word girl in it. Um, exactly the same with Harry Potter and all those kind of big publishing phenomena that come out of nowhere. So I wonder if this is a, this is kind of a trend that's going to gun, gun, gun run its course in the end. You know, we we, we had the the kind of quirky friends. Uh, uh, um, uh, discussing things that don't really matter stuff that, the podcast that came mm. off the back of my dad wrote a porno yeah. mm. which again was something that came completely out of nowhere and became a huge phenomenon so it's, it's kind of people people chasing that last thing Scott are you going to tune in? I mean as part of my job I probably won't have to <laughs> <laughs> Well audio of a different kind this time BBC Local Radio uh, quite um We've talked about it on the podcast before. A lot of changes to BBC Local Radio. They're regionalising afternoon programmes, uh, putting national shows in at some other times. They remain local kind of from 6am to 1 or 2pm. Yeah. Um, but one of uh, the presenters, Sophie Little, who's leaving the BBC from BBC Radio Norfolk, well, she had this to tell uh, listeners on Monday. I believe in all that it stands it. for. It's vital yeah. and it's important. But I will say this how I see it. I feel the cuts are ableist, ageist, and they place economic barriers for some people too. And I felt incredibly nervous to say this, thinking about the many bosses above my head and how this goes against the grain of all of the training I've ever had in my 15 years that I've been here. She's not very happy. Is she, is she right, uh, Scott? I mean, I think she highlights the fact that local radio does have a strong um, uh, role to play in communities. And it's also incredibly difficult to know when something's being cut off because the people who have been affected might not speak out because they might be elderly they might be by mm. themselves they might not have access to the internet to express their frustrations about something that they seem to be uh, see to be essential um uh, no longer being available as much or as frequently as, as it used to i think it's also the fact that um I mean, at the same time, though, you have to understand the, the financial pressures that the BBC is undergoing. I mean, it's having to have a shortfall in regards to about 285 million because of the licence fee freeze until 2024. And they've clearly looked at their entire budget and then they've gone, we can no longer support the amount of services that we currently do, even though we have got in, um, a, a substantial commercial income coming in too. And the choice that they've made has been merge the BBC World News and, and news channels into one single standalone service and to make these cutbacks on local um, uh, radio and to hope that they can make some sort of digital thing out of it. Yeah, I mean, that, their view, and I find it hard to disagree with this. So this kind of puts me against most of the people in, in local radio. So BBC Local Radio is a great service. It reaches about 15% of, of licence fee payers who, who tune in. Moving some of the money to digital content 
that people can access through the website or podcasts or or whatever isn't a dreadful way of trying to broaden how they reach people with local news and information. I mean, the BBC are always going to be pilloried for whatever their decision are, aren't they, Adam? I think they deserve to be in this case. I think this is absolutely disastrous. Do you listen to the BBC? No, I don't, because I'm not the target market. The target market is people that Sophie Little was talking about there, who are largely over 80. A lot of them are housebound. A lot of them are disabled. And a lot of them rely on that as as for, you know, companionship and and all the things that the BBC as a a national broadcaster should be providing. But they'll still get local content at big parts of the day, like they've always had. They, they will, but, they, but it's those, those familiar voices are going. And the other, the other clip I heard, and, and it has been done in such a typically BBC way because the, 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 the cuts were announced months ago and they, they seem to be sort of dribbling out over different radio networks at different times. In the, mm. in the traditional BBC way, as um, the Reverend Richard Coles complained about when he was got rid of from his Radio 4 programme, none of them have been given a chance to say goodbye properly on air, which is why they're having to grab moments like mm. this if they're brave like Sophie Little. Um, and, and there was a, a, a clip I heard a little while ago from another uh, BBC local radio station where there was a a pensioner who phoned in he was actually 100 years old and he was kind of a regular guest on the programme his phone in programme absolutely in tears because he just said you know I'm good. this is this is my lifeline this is what I look forward to every day and and, and, and they'd been they'd done a live broadcast an outside broadcast from his house for his 100th mm. birthday and things and, and that, that whole sense of kind of local community and stuff seems to me the sort of thing that yes the BBC has got to cut money but why are they cutting it in the areas which are all the things that only the BBC does and which no one commercial is going to step in and do like local radio like classical music all of those things that actually make the BBC unique. I mean, surely you should be looking, if you're competing with your Netflixes and your Amazon Primes and all of these kind of streaming services, you don't want to be doing the same stuff as them. You need to be focusing on, if you're going to justify the license fee, you want to be saying, this is what we offer that no one else offers. It reminds me a lot of when all of the newspapers went online in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. And they all, instead of going, oh, we've got our individual brands and the things that we specialise in, let's let's kind of really concentrate on that. They all decided instead they had to homogenise and produce exactly the same content and be competing for the same breaking stories at exactly the same time. No, take what you're good at and make that your specialism. Like Disney Plus have with, you know, saying we do Marvel, we do mm. Star Wars, we do these kind of things. The BBC should be going, these are the things that the BBC does, this is what makes us a public service broadcaster, this is what we've done really, really well for generations and that's where we're going to concentrate our money and that's but is, why but, but you that, should pay the licence But fee. isn't that part of the problem in that they have done it for generations and the world's changing, people are changing, how people communicate, how they get their, their content, how they get local content shifts and if they don't make some changes to try and identify that switch then they'll be even further left behind. They absolutely can, but I think the changes need to be more gradual in the case of this this this, this, this particular case, Being, making it a cliff edge for elderly and housebound listeners that, that suddenly they just find what they've got used to is not there anymore. And maybe they're not, you know, they, a lot of these people probably don't even have broadband, they probably can't even access the internet. The idea that they're all suddenly go online, going to go online and become silver servers. servers well, it's not necessarily for them. They're still going. going to listen to that, that radio station probably. And there's still a lot of local content on But there. it's not, but not, they, not other, what they wanted to listen to. Is well, it? a decent chunk of it will be. Of course, it's sad when you lose any of any of the presenters you like which is the thing we often come back to in radio that connection people have uh, there is some radio investment uh, on the other side um, this is in commissioning uh, Scott have you seen uh, what's happening with this this is network BBC network radio uh, they're widening the number of people that do commissioning of shows I mean I was sort of hoping that you know a lot about more about this than I do <laughs> because um, you're very much the, the audio um, sort of person but I mean they are spending so on um, on commissioning of Radio 2, 3 and 4 and 5 um, and with the uh, Radio 5 role being part of their BBC's diversity and inclusion uh, strategy and I think it's important to sort of highlight that a lot of these roles are outside London, aren't mm, they? Yes. As well. So I guess it's trying to ensure that it's very much fitting with the BBC mantra these days of having as much as mu- much more out of London than it was before. But is there anything else that sort of stands yeah, to you so in regards to this announcement? There was a comment from Heidi Dawson, who's the controller of Five Live. Yeah. Um, and that's the, also the head of the BBC in Salford. Uh, and she was saying that for Five Live, Assistant Commissioner will work on the station's slate of BBC Sounds podcasts. And the role will also broaden the pipeline for deaf, disabled and or neurodivergent talent. And um, for them, the role will be based in Salford. Um, similarly, Radio 3, um, more diverse content. Uh, Radio 2 could be in London or Salford. Um it's a, it's a good idea, isn't it, that to try and think about differently about the stuff that's coming into the building and, and what people are pitching in? I think there's two really, really interesting things about this announcement. The first one is that it, it that all, all of these commissioning jobs are being attached to different um, BBC radio stations. But I think all of them, certainly some of them, they've said that it's going to be working on the slate that those stations are making for BBC Sounds. Yep. So this is more what we were talking about. It's that gradual move over to realising that people are listening to radio in a different way. A lot of people are listening to radio on demand through BBC Sounds and, and the whole thing is moving that way. But gradually, again, mm. Not off a cliff edge. And the other thing I just want to pick 
pick up on is, you know, again, as everything is with the BBC and with most broadcasters now, is being presented as this great move out of London. Well, you actually look, dig into the small print of this. Um, one, of the, one, one, of, one of the jobs is in London. The other four are all in Salford. So what you're essentially doing is creating, not, not, not spreading things out around different areas of the country, but actually creating something that is literally called Media City. You've just created kind of another enormous media village in a different part of the country. And I can just see a sort of 10, down, 10, 10 years down the line, exactly the same conversations happening as happened before the creation of, um, uh, before the BBC moved up to Salford, of saying, well, you know, everything's a bit too concentrated in London and Salford now. Where else are we going to go? Well, maybe there'll be uh, a move to Birmingham or to Hull or somewhere. Well, somewhere Hull, there's an awful lot this. of spare desks and studios in Hull now because they've, they've got <laughs> and, and all sorts of other parts of the country because they got rid of all the local radio presenters. Well, someone else who's clearing their desk uh, is someone this time from Bauer. This is Richard Dawkins, the um, uh, president of audio at Bauer. Um, he's leaving and there was a very strange press release. Did you see this press release? You sent uh, it to me uh, just before because um, it only broke really in the last couple of hours. And it says the wording of um, the, the way that they've said that he's leaving. It's, quote, due to differing ideas around the next phase of transformation of Bauer Media's audio business. And that's why Yvonne Bauer and Richard Dawkins have decided to go their separate ways. It feels very much like a divorce yeah, it's agreement like it's sort of... than it does actually saying goodbye. Because normally when somebody leaves, even if they've left and it's all gone to shit, <laughs> you, you normally have a really happy... Up buzz. Yes. Oh yeah, I'm really happy to leave. Wish Actually, them this luck is what in I wanted. Future ventures. This is exactly what I wanted, guys. I really wanted to leave right now with no warning and no notice. But with this, just to actually kind of emphasize it specifically right at the top, it's it like seems weird. It's like they've consciously uncoupled. It's almost that, isn't and it? It's musical that... differences, isn't yeah. it? It's those classic <laughs> rock breakups, and it's going to turn out, you know, years down the line, Mojo will do some special on well, who broke a guitar over whose head. Uh, well, it's their brand, so they'll get to do that. But so how is good. how is Bauer doing compared to, let's say, Capital and all yeah, of the so, rivals? I mean, if you, if you look at what's happened with them in the past, um, in the four years he's been there, actually, it's been pretty good for Bauer. They've been growing their total hours, launch of Greatest Hits Radio, uh, acquired lots of radio stations along the way. Um, and at the Radio Festival this weekend, a lot of people were saying not hearing huge amounts from global they used to be the ones that did all the big stuff and the shiny things whereas Bauer's taken a sort of stolen a bit of a march yeah um, so you could I mean who knows what the money looks like it's a, a privately held business now um, based in Germany but uh, he would seem to have done quite a good job so um, there must have been quite the split maybe we'll hear some some gossip later on but what I find fascinating is how in commercial radio there is a lot of money sort of being thrown, thrown around like you know capital poaching a lot of talent sort of very very quickly and of course Bauer with Ken Bruce mm -hmm. and making uh, greatest hits radio but I remember like only just over a decade ago commercial radio was kind of in the doldrums and I sort of wondered why it flips around 180 where's well, this all come from well the big the big shift has been re reduction in regulation uh, which means you can run these things like traditional businesses so that's very boring things which you know has a big effect on staff so number one there's far less people working in radio than there was 10 years ago and it comes some far fewer buildings and actually save a huge amount of money uh, shutting down buildings all over the country. So for Global and Bauer, um, they're sort of in much ruder financial health because uh, they'll be able to reduce their cost base significantly so they can invest in in programming. Um, so yeah, so they've, 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 they're both doing, doing, doing pretty well. Uh, and Bauer's pretty adventurous. They put a lot of radio stations in Ireland. Uh, they've done it in other markets as well. Um, so it'd be interesting to see uh, what happens next or what Yvonne Bauer, uh, son of the founder... What uh, they have a falling out of. Uh, I want to have a podcast investigative series to try to uh, work out. A special six part run. We will talk about that uh, during this break, after which we will be back. Welcome back to the Media Podcast. Uh, now, it uh, is the season for new podcast launches, and BBC Sounds have just launched a show all about public relations. When it hits the fan, uh, looks back at the week's biggest PR disasters with two seasoned professionals, David Yelland and Simon Lewis. Uh, I caught up with both of them, and in this chat we discussed how their former employers have changed. Uh, David was editor of The Sun, and Simon ran comms at number 10 for Gordon Brown. But I started off by asking Simon how they first met. David and I have known each other for a long time. We met when Dave was newly appointed of the Sun. I was newly appointed communications secretary at Buckingham Palace. So we both lived through, David puts it, he said, two careers or two halves. I've been in communications the whole time. It just, it's clear that people, first of all, are very interested in crises, just by definitions. But secondly, they just like to know what's going on under the bonnet. And so we, we started talking about it. You know, we'd kept in touch over the years. And it crystallised around this idea. And I guess the big inside, David, was 
rather than making a retrospective, which we could have done, we thought let's make it a current affairs type programme. So that's the kind of big shift in thinking as we talked it through. I mean, the danger, David, is that the the Westminster bubble is an echo chamber uh, and it's it's everyone, uh, politicos, uh, me- media types, lobby journalists, all kind of playing the same game and having fun doing it rather than thinking about the public. Um, is that the case or is that me being mean? Well, I just wrote down echo chamber. Well, so, well, so, well, so you took the words out, literally took the words out of my mouth. That echo chamber has never been more powerful, particularly on the right. So the echo chamber between the Conservative Party at the moment and, you know, Fleet Street, what we used to call Fleet Street, uh, and that would include GB News and Talk TV now, particularly GB News, is dictating the agenda on the right of the aisle. Uh, And they listen to each other. They employ each other. I mean, we, you know, we see uh, a whole series of ministers coming out of a government straight in straight into the studio uh, as pre- as presenters without naming any we know who these people are Reese Morgan well, you know you know they are what's happened during my since I left newspapers is that the media the media class has overtaken the political class and become the same thing so we literally had a journalist in number 10 which you know didn't work very well and the reason the media class overtook the political class is they're better they're smarter, they've got better people. And that's very sad for our democracy. And at some point, that has to change. Um, so that's the sort of macro issue. On the left, if you, if you, if you class the Labour Party as the left, the jury's out, really. We, they haven't been in power for so long. There are disturbing signs, actually, that uh, Keir Starmer's team, some of the younger members of it anyway, are spending a lot of time trying to make friends with you know, my old paper, The Sun, and the Daily Mail. And they're looking for... They're looking for the nod. My view very firmly is that they do not need that nod and that to seek it is dangerous and to get it is dangerous. You're someone that uh, became editor of The Sun just after Tony Blair came in, partly to perhaps reflect the changing nature of politics at that point. Isn't Keir Starmer just doing what what Tony Blair did uh, when he flew out to a a News Corp conference before, before his election? Yeah, but The Sun sold nearly four million copies then. And it was incredibly powerful and influential and there was no social media. It's a very, very different world. The sun is not important politically now. uh, And that is just the truth. It's a it's a loss making newspaper which has been written down with zero value on the balance sheet of of News Limited. And the mail is still very important. The sun can still cause you problems. It's best best not to to, to kick it to kick it around but it but you know you don't need to go and have dinner there you know that that's the difference if, if, um, if, that, if that's if that's your take do you think the sun as a as a print publication has um has its own deadline when when it'll expire obviously the the online version does well but it's a different kind of business well there are a whole whole host of issues there but are, are, are digitally the sun is successful it's, but it's not. It's it, it's an entertainment product which is doing very well, but it's it doesn't have political clout in the digital world. There's no one. There's no Gen Gen Z person that looks that looks to the Sun online or the Daily Mail or Daily Mail online to influence it influence them politically. The older generation who are looking at the op eds are influenced. So oddly, as these papers succeed in the digital world. They lose their political influence. It's a very odd, a very odd thing. I remember seeing Mario Cuomo. Mario Cuomo actually was governor of the state of New York. Came to lunch when I was on the New York Post, uh, and uh, he said that he knew when he'd lost the gubernatorial race in New York when Rupert backed. I think it was Pataki, the other side. He he said even though the Post in New York only sold. I think it's half a million copies and was loss making and wasn't anywhere near as big as the as the New York Times. Rupert's call, Cuomo knew he was dead because everybody else would think he was dead and therefore he was dead. There is still that there is that is still true of of of, of Rupert Murdoch. He doesn't get it wrong, but it doesn't influence a vote. It's not. It's, I don't think it's a single person in the country that's going to change their vote based on newspaper backing it's it's not about that it's about the day-to-day stuff and the fact is if Labour get elected from day one they will be clattered in these papers 
day in, day out, and that will affect them because the BBC will pick up those clattering stories because some of them will be true. Um, and that's the problem. It's the noise, well, the weather. Just to build on that very quickly, I mean, what struck me, I was obviously in number 10, just effectively the last year of Gordon Brown or the, the Labour government of that era. And the, ch- the problem is, if you get a sheer weight of negative, completely kind of overriding negative press, it's very, very, what's the word, enervating. And it's, it's almost the climate it creates. It's not even the fact it's taking place. It's the fact that every day you wake up and you're seeing stuff that you know either isn't right or has just been written from a particular perspective. So I think it gets into the marrow of the bone of people who are on the receiving end of it. And that's, I think, as David said, why actually the traditional press is still quite important, because that climate they can create is very, very difficult to deal with. Well, so, well yeah. Simon, I mean, looking at the yeah. news today, um, uh, Sir Paul Marshall, who was one of the guys that's really funding GB News, um, looks like he's going to put in a, a bid uh, for your brother's old paper, the Daily Telegraph. Uh, I mean, oh. kind of building on that, it's the idea of um, you know, creating a bit of a, a, a sort of a multimedia right wing empire. Uh, I mean, that's got to be inspired by what's happening in America and, and, and Rupert's success around around Fox News. Do you think he would be a, a likely owner of, of, of the Telegraph? Well, obviously, there's a process being run, which is interesting in itself. I mean, it's been run by a, a, an investment bank, Goldman Sachs. So what's what's very interesting about that is having been on the other side. You know, if you run a process, you have to have a timeline. You have to have a decision making process. So I think this race is far from run. I think it's kind of connected to what we've just been talking about. If you have got a lot of money and you want to exert influence, you're probably feeling that you're more likely to get a bigger bang for your buck going into a media group which has a significant social media kind of presence than buying or picking up a newspaper. I know that obviously Telegraph still has a traditional paper, but I think most people would say they've done pretty well in online terms. There are a couple of wonderful prizes in there, including the spectator, which might be attractive to someone who wants to sort of be involved in the intellectual sort of side of right wing politics. But I, I think the Telegraph race is a classic example where the bankers will ultimately have to work out two things. First of all, who's got the money? And secondly, which of the bidders, and maybe all of them are kind of fit and proper people, which is the decision of the bankers, but it's an important point, fit and proper person to run a media group. And that's always on the minds of the politicians, of course. Sam is absolutely right. This is a this is a this is a horse race, and one of the horses has gone public and said he's in the race. That's all that's happened. It doesn't necessarily mean, but I think there's a real risk that the Telegraph and GB News together could become a, a, a sideshow and a money losing sideshow as well in the in the great political game. Uh, I'm not absolutely certain that that market exists. And Fox News became the most profitable television news television entity in the world. But that's because there was no, that's the US, it's the US, and there was no right wing station in the whole of mm. the US, and it took that it took that market. But if you look at the numbers of Fox News, sometimes on the day to day basis, they're not that high, even in the US, right? I don't think that market exists. I think I think you know Paul Marshall might convince himself that market exists in in the, in the UK, but he. I'm not sure it does. And we'll find out. I mean, you know, I may be wrong, but I'm not well, sure it does. If you think about um, that, we've talked about um, the big figures, talked about companies, talked, talked about media. Um, who would be a good client to work for today? Uh, who could benefit from from great PR skills? Uh, Simon. Well, having just set up an advisor business, I hope the answer to that is plenty of people because that's the other thing that I do in my non-podcast. I mean, there's a family joke that, you know, I've worked for the Queen and I've worked for the Prime Minister that just leaves the Pope, which is a family joke. Um, I, I must say, I, I've i always been fascinated by the world of sport. I love, I love sport. I love the politics of sport. I love the dynamics of sport. And I suppose if I ever had the opportunity to help in the kind of communications around one of the great football clubs, I happen to support Arsenal, someone like that. It just, I think that's a, it's a fascinating world. But on the other hand, I guess be careful what we wish for, because if you get involved in something you're too passionate about, it probably isn't a great combination. But I think the world of sport, which we're going to, I'm sure, come back to. We did a piece today about the booing of Macron, or in the, in the podcast about the booing of Macron, the rugby. It's, very, it's a very combustible world, the world of sport. And when sport and politics collide, it can be very tricky. Uh, David, who would you like to work with? Greta Thunberg is the person I'd mentioned. I think that 
if I look at my children, uh, particularly my younger daughter, uh, my younger child, who's my daughter, uh, I think, you know, climate change, it's very important that Greta Thunberg uh, and that generation frame their argument correctly in the next 10 years in particular, because it, they are close to losing the argument. And that's uh, very sad. So I think uh, I think that's it is the biggest issue of our time, and it's very important that the, that the next generation get their argument right. But at the moment, you know, they're sitting in front of ambulances on the M1 and losing lots of lots of friends, and and I think that's a disaster. So I think that that's probably the answer to that question. Uh, well, thank you both. It hits the fan is available on BBC Sounds each week. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, interesting to hear about David Yellen and what he had to say there. Slightly down on the sun, obviously he has his own relationship with it. Uh, was he right? Do, do politicos think that the press has more power than it actually does? I think uh, the press has always liked to claim, particularly the Sun, that, that, that it had more power than yeah. it ever did. I mean, the Sun won, won mm. it in 1992. Um, and Rupert Murdoch has always been very, very astute at backing people who he knew was going knew were going to win already. Um, so it would surprise me enormously if he backs Rishi Sunak at the next election. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get the sort of wholehearted endorsement that... Um, uh, that, that, that Tony Blair got in 1997 at an incredibly late stage. I'm mean, thinking mm. of something like March 1997. You know, it was very, very clear what direction uh, things were moving in. Um, but, but, uh, but, but I mean, David Yelland is right. I, do, I, do, I don't think it would make an enormous difference now uh, 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 to anyone. I mean, digitally, it's really interesting. I was thinking about, thinking about the Mail website. It, the politics on that is buried very, very deep within it. You know, behind mm. a, a, a wall of Kardashians. Mm. Um, you have to dig very, very hard to find that at all. The paper is still rabidly, rabidly political, but they are going for that different audience it's that it's that older audience who who i think they can have an effect on and they're they're kind of i mean it's going to be interesting to watch them do a reverse burrow because there is no way that the mail is going to back anyone other than the tories in the upcoming election but they're very very down on rishi sunak's government at the moment and they're kind of the last last uh, last people holding a candle for the prince over the water in the form of their columnist boris johnson so uh it's going to be a, a, an, an awkward negotiation for them to kind of go well i know we've been saying the tories are rubbish but um but and, and, and the other guy's better that they kicked out but you should still vote for them anyway and yeah. Hold, your, hold your nose and vote. Yeah, I guess that would be it, wouldn't it? Uh, it's interesting thinking about the, the online side of things because uh, I mean, Daily Mail has made a very profitable move online mm. um, and The Sun was late to the game pretty much. But uh, The Sun, I think, is doing quite well online, yeah. isn't it? And it's expanded out, as they all are, all, all of the tabloids are now, into America as mm. well. And I think it's doing quite well over there. Of course, they've got resources over there because Murdoch also mm. owns the New York Post, which is kind of a, a similar, lot, similar kind of audience. And all there's some these spaces, going on. All these spaces, it's a lot of UK journalists that have been sort of bussed over um, to the That's States been to, the tradition to, for a long time, something. though, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the kind of National Enquirers had British editors, and they're, 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 there's always been a kind of a cross a transatlantic trade between um, uh, b- b- between those outlets. Um, yeah, no, well, I mean, part, I think part of that is because American newspapers are largely so boring, <laughs> um, and they actually need a few. I mean, a few tabloid funsters to, to 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 brighten things up. I mean, to be honest, I think we could do with a few tabloid funsters back at the Sun, which I think has turned into one of the dullest newspapers in the business. The Daily Star has roared in and taken all of the fun front pages and is doing that kind of it and I, I you know I flick through the sun every day but I just think what this paper once was many many years ago it, it, whether you liked it or not it very much isn't now I don't even find it very very entertaining uh, well that's because they're too busy hiring SEO editors to work on to work on the website um, Scott I don't know if you saw um, Mail Plus and News UK were at a press gazette event this week uh, sharing their recent learnings um, did we glean anything from them I mean the Mail sort of said that it's doing quite well with Mail Plus because it's, so it's, it's like a subscription option it's a subscription option you get a essentially a digital replica of what the paper looks like and is it a pdf yes <laughs> and and but but they say that they've got 160,000 subscriptions and 90,000 of them are dig- digital but if you subscribe to the mail print edition you also get the pdf thrown right. in as if you want to be like here's again here it is again <laughs> but the pdf so i mean i but this is the thing i mean i i am a i am a newspaper reader um, and I, I, I tend to have a print version each day, which I think people, my mates around my age think that's quite weird because mm. not many people do, but I quite like having a paper edition in, in my hand. But then I don't really like mobile versions on my mobile because I don't really absorb the news in the same way. I quite like the fact that a new newspaper has a beginning and an end. So I quite, 
I, I can see the appeal of digital replicas because it feels as if you're having a ha halfway house between having a paper that you might not always be able to get or, or can be really having the faff to, mm. but also not having the entire internet to be dealing with and an endless array of news. You're, you're still getting a bit of curation. So I can see why these di di digital products tend to do quite well. Well, Adam, I mean, if you're looking at a reach um, a website, you have to close down seven pop-ups. Uh, oh, stop, God, stop they're the... all a nightmare. They're, no, I mean, they're, they're, they're just appalling. No, I'm, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm going to come out here. Well, I you're, am, you're, I, well, well, I would say that you're from a publication that hasn't necessarily done lots of things on digital. Barely anything at all. <laughs> not, apart not from our own podcast, page 94, which I'm going to plug yet again. <laughs> now you've given me the chance to. Um, no, I mean, I, 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 actually, I'd just like to come out here as a Mail Plus subscriber. Although I did not realise that I was. I have to say, I wonder how many <laughs> other people are in the position I'm. Because I, I like Scott, I like, I, I like to read papers. Um, and and I, for my job, I have to read most of the papers every day. But for the sake of my recycling bin, I subscribed several years ago to digital versions of most of them, mm. uh, which I read on my iPad in the morning. Uh, and I realised at some point in the last couple of years that it, what I thought was the digital version of the mail have been turned into something called mail plus right which apparently comes with all these other bells and whistles and podcast facilities and i can look at pictures of uh joanne hegarty uh, modeling the latest fashions and, and and hear sarah vine should i should i should i should i ever want to do that um but I, I had no idea about that i still have no idea how to access them so i do wonder how many people are in the same position as me that they thought they were just subscribing to a kind of a, a, a slightly more um more high-tech version of the paper. And, it seems and actually, to be a very yeah. modern thing, isn't it? Just have any brand and just say, and add the word plus onto the end of it. Just oh, yeah. add plus. It, it's it like about 20 years ago, you put E on the front of everything to look kind of incredibly <laughs> yeah. modern, isn't it? Yeah. But I have to say, where I think the mail have been clever is what you get with Mail Plus, apparently, is a lot of puzzles. And I think that's one of the selling things. I think it's one of the really salutary facts for all journalists that we should constantly remind ourselves of, that people don't buy newspapers for us at all. They may occasionally look at a, a, at a splash story on the front page and buy it for that, or they may have a columnist they like, but mostly they're getting it for the crossword. Well, New York, That's what they're New York, after. New York Times subscriptions are particularly driven by a, a lot of their quiz-related action. But <laughs> Mail Plus, you get page after page of puzzle and puzzle after puzzle. And, and, and I think that's that, that's really, really clever. I mean, the Mail have always been very, very good at knowing their readers and knowing what their readers want and giving it to them. And, uh, and that, that, I think, will be behind the success of that as much as it is behind the print newspaper. The answer is puzzles. Another thing to add to the media podcast. Uh, right, just time for the media quiz, which this week is Thank entitled... Way classified so very newspapery uh, in lieu of actual ads here on the podcast though brands do get in touch there's always a link in the show notes uh, we have prepared some cryptic classifieds based on some more media stories of the week you just have to guess the story from the ad uh, buzz in with your name if you know the answer so scott you will say scott and adam you will say uh, adam uh, here good. we go right question one wanted new home for elderly pet oscar can be needy and often up late at night. Scott. Scott. Uh, it is ITV and ITVX becoming the new home of the Oscars. It is, uh, and they are. Um, it's been with the BBC, oh, it's been Sky for a long time. Sky for it? quite a few years mm. now. I mean, this is the the, the thing, is, is that Sky had the rights. I didn't think many people knew that they had the rights. <laughs> I mean, they had no idea. I mean, then again, it is shown at 1am yes. till whenever. Um, so, of course, it has been there for a few years. I think this last year they put it on, um, or this year, earlier this year, they put it on Sky Arts and mm. Sky News rather than just on um, Sky Cinema. So, so you could watch it on free view as so well. So you could watch yeah. it on free to air. So there's not going to be that much difference, I guess, I guess, um, in terms of people be being able to watch the awards apart from Dan being on a different channel. I guess maybe it might be more of the case that ITV will make a bit more of a song and dance about it. Mm. I, I don't think Sky's really done anything. Mm. Do you think they'll re-show it, it in prime time? Because that's the thing with a lot of the oh. Sky Atlantic stuff, you know, the HBO stuff, they showed uh, six new episodes mm. of Succession went out of three in the morning kind of simultaneously with America but then they were shown the next night at 9pm have, you, seen, have, you, just seen, watch it have you just seen all the clips by then I, Probably, think I, mean, I just think yeah I just think like, people are over it but by then because, because people wait, wait it's up. very boring I mean once you've seen Except Will for, Smith slap yeah, someone I had then to. you don't want to sit through the, the, the kind of best makeup and best oh, videography 100% and, like a real oh, um, mm. but then it's also the case that you turn up and it's one of my favourite joys is just seeing um, uh, like a BBC entertainment reporter or Good Morning Britain entertainment reporter just yelling at a random staff really far away the morning <laughs> after the Oscars live because it's, you know, live because they're at the uh, Vanity Fair party mm. trying to get an exclusive interview and hopelessly failing. For me, that <laughs> is my Oscars coverage. The Oscars, that yeah. is for me the best bit about it. Uh, right, uh, well done. Uh, question number two. Wanted, London's answer to the Met Gala. Organiser must have multiple faces. <laughs> is it too cryptic? Oh, Adam, is Adam. this is this to do with who's hosting? The Met Gala's Vogue, right? Yes. So is this to do with who's hosting it? Because Edward Anifal has just been um, 
I don't want to say booted out. Moved to a different job within the outgoing, British Vogue. The outgoing yeah. British Vogue boss. Yes, you are just about right. I'll give you, give you a point for that. Uh, this is Vogue World, uh, described as a multi-act celebration of British performing arts, which has been curated by uh, reportedly Vogue's editor-in-chief, Anna Wintour, uh, and uh, the outgoing uh, London boss, Edward Ennefall. Um, Rumours persist that this is uh, Wintour sort of reaffirming her sort of control of the brand. I just got to say that's a terrible title, Vogue World, because I immediately just thought of M and M World in Leicester Square. It just sounds really, really naff. The smell for M and M World as well as foul. It's nice to see like an old-fashioned power play uh, in this in this fashion world, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't know too much about the fashion world generally, <laughs> as you can clearly tell. So, <laughs> uh, okay. On that, moving uh, moving on to number three, seeing both the facts and the fury. This reporter will identify why the pop star's influence only expands what her fan base stand for in pop culture. Oh, Adam. Sorry, I couldn't remember my name then to buzz in. That's really <laughs> appalling as I forgot what I had to it's say. the pressure of the media quiz. <laughs> this is the Taylor Swift reporter, isn't it? Yes, it's a real, real job ad uh, for a Taylor Swift reporter being sought uh, for USA Today uh, and the Tennessean. Specifically just to report on Taylor Swift. Just, I mean, don't get me wrong, it could be lucrative. When I was at BuzzFeed, <laughs> there was a person whose literal sole job was to write about the Kardashians every single day. And it would bring in... But there's there. loads of them. There's only one Taylor <laughs> Swift. I mean, when you're literally just, your job is to report on one person, I mean, that's sort of verging into the stalker territory, isn't it? <laughs> Do you end up being a bit like that, the royal reporter, that Nicholas Witchell sort of hated by the, the person um, slash people you're trying to cover? I'd imagine she's going to get a restraining <laughs> order, isn't she? <laughs> Back to SEO. I mean, that's about you know, content that works, isn't it? Yeah, but also just the fact that fandoms seem to go for hourly updates. Mm. I mean, you only have to go onto the search bar on Instagram to go and see where some stars are by the hour. So I think that... Clearly, they're just going, right, how can we hone in on? And I mean, I, 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 I can see about why it's raised some eyebrows. It's probably given, bizarrely, quite a lot of publicity to the magazine, to the title with themselves, yes. really. Uh, are either of you going to throw your hat in the ring to be the Taylor I'm Swift reporter? I'm not really a Swifty. <laughs> My, my are, there any pop, is, are there my any pop stars? Is. Are there any pop stars that you would like to be a full-time reporter about? Harry Styles, uh, <laughs> but that's a general crush. <laughs> that's not reporting, Scott. That's not. The Adam, same Adam, thing. I got a crush on him. The Adam, end. is there anybody in the world that you you, you could sort of completely uh, focus your your time on? Uh, no, but the cheeky girls live just down the road from me, so I could <laughs> always report on them. The I don't girls. think I don't think I sell many stories. To be the honest. cheeky girls performed earlier this week. I saw at the University of Salford's Freshers Week, oh, okay. to which some people responded. Like the people at the university weren't even alive when they were big. And just, <laughs> Who are these people? Why did they get books? Uh, well, uh, congratulations, Adam. Um, uh, first time luck. Obviously, you win uh, the media quiz, uh, and you get to you get to be our full time Taylor Swift reporter. That's Fantastic. your prize. I'll go to them, um, listen to some Taylor Swift songs, did not I? Uh, my thanks to Scott Bryan and Adam McQueen. Uh, where can people catch up with uh, your good work, Scott? Um, just on what I guess is now X. Yes. Yeah. Sad. At Scotty GB. Sad face. Sad face. Uh, Adam. Uh, I'm kind of off X these days, although you can still find an account there where I occasionally plug things at uh, Adam McQueen. But I'm now on Instagram. Uh, uh, on I think I have to be McQueen Adam on Instagram, but really I'm only on there to look at Scott Bryant's thirst traps. So. Uh, there we go. Is there an Adam McQueen? So you've had to flip the other way. There's an American footballer. Oh, yeah. He learns something new every day. Mm. Uh, well, all of you can look at each other's uh, uh, Instagram accounts. Uh, and you, you, you at home can as well. Uh, thank you both for joining us. <laughs> 